Okay, that's right now. So let me get back here. All right. Welcome to Melt to Meet. It is August 13th, 2023, year of the Lord. And a couple of weeks ago, we started studying, um, you know, um, about the omniscience, the omni series or the omni attributes of God. And last week, uh, we learned about what it meant when we say God is omnipresent. Uh, uh, a week, a few weeks before that, uh, or the week before that, we looked at what it meant by when we say God is omniscient, and today we'll actually be looking at uh, uh, the other God. God is omnipotent. Uh, Psalm 139. Uh, it says, "Well, it says, if I go to the heavens, you are there. If I descend to the depths, uh, which some renditions would render it as hell, you're there." And then the question was posed: How can God, who's holy, be in hell? And uh, I'm going to actually uh, take more of a a, a purposeful study about that because we want to look at the scripture in terms of what that means in terms of God's omnipresence everywhere, um, including in the realm of the dead, and uh, what that really means. Uh, we also will be expanding more about that in the doctrine of angelology and demonology as we go through this this doctrinal study. So we've been looking at the doctrinal foundations of a Christian for a Christian, and uh, the. The first uh, uh, doctrinal foundation is the study of God or theology, and our study today is going to be on what it means that God is omnipotent. Uh, in fact, the psalmist explains and expresses this, uh, or exclaims and expresses this in about God's omnipotence in Psalm chapter 77, verse 14, and Psalm 145, verse 6, which you probably are familiar with, uh, where it says in 77, verse 14 of the book of Psalms, uh, thou art the God that doest wonders, thou hast declared the strength among thy people. And Psalm 145 verse 6 says, And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare the, thy greatness. Now, um, as we look at this, the, the, the phrase, God is omnipotent, um, the Latin word omni is all or every, and potens is for potent. Uh, the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms actually defines um, the omnipotence of God as God's ability to do all things that do not conflict with his divine will or knowledge or his essence or his nature. God's power is limited only by God's own nature and not by any external force. And the verses to substantiate that is Job chapter 40, 42, verse 2, Matthew 19, 26, and Luke 1, 37. Um, now, from a more layman's term, if we were to look at what, is, what does it mean when we say God is omnipotent, it's to virtually have... Um, absolute power, influence, and authority. Uh, generally, it is used nowadays in the context of somebody who's got high power or authority, um, as in our companies or in our churches and in other other uh, in our schools. Uh, but originally, when the word omnipotent was being used in the uh, in the English language, it was exclusively used to refer to Almighty God and His power. Um, now it's been you know more tainted down. Um, but the question then I still have to ask is, what does it mean when we say that God is omnipotent? What does that mean? What are your thoughts? God is all-powerful. All-powerful, okay. All-powerful. He can make impossible things possible. He can make impossible things <clears throat> possible, which we'll expand on in our study today. Beautiful. So I want, us to, I want us to look at about three views in terms of God's power is absolute, number one. Okay, and we'll look at what that means. Second is that there is no realm that is outside of the power or authority or influence of God. And we look at some examples of different realms today from scripture and, you know, uh, given the limitation of time we have, we look at the big ones that we at least know. But there is absolutely no realm outside of God's power. And then it means that with what may seem impossible with man is possible with God. In fact, the word omnipotence comes from the the, the the motif that there is nothing that is too hard for the Lord. Uh, in fact, the word hard over there in the original Hebrew, where God is asking Abraham and Sarah, uh, and we'll see that later in our study today, the word hard over there is to mean something that is wonderful, something that is marvelous, something that is miraculous. There is So we think of it in the context of like the, the difficulty or in the ability aspect, but that the word hard there, when it says nothing is too hard for the Lord, it means nothing is nothing that is miraculous, wonderful, or or something that is marvelous is an impossibility with God. That's essentially what it means. So we look at these in, in the context of these three views as we study the, the, the text, what it means that God is omnipotent. 
The first one over here is um, hands. Um, I'm getting a redirect here. Give me one second. That's not what I wanted to do. Cancel. Okay. okay. Um, why is this not letting me move forward? Cancel navigation. Okay. All right. So Psalm 114, 47 verse 5. Uh, it talks about that great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Now, you may have heard about this phrase, uh, power tends to corrupt and absolute power. Absolutely. Uh, uh, who was in the 1834s to the 1900s in the 19th century, who is known as the magistrate of history and a great historian. He's writing in correspondence to a Bishop Crichton uh, in terms, and this is what he actually writes. And he says, um, I have an excerpt from that, the, one of the letters where he says, I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge Pope and King, unlike other men, with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way against holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority. Still more when you super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. There is no worse heresy than that the office sanctifies the holder of it. What Acton is actually saying over here is that it does not matter who you are. If you're a religious leader or a government leader or any leader with people, they all have to be held to the same moral standards or the same standards of God. There is absolutely no one who's got any power. And if they do have power, then the tendency is for them to be using that power in a corrupt manner. Um, so the question then we have to ask is, why is that the case? Why is it that man uses power corruptly? Because they're selfish. Because they're selfish, okay. If you go back, self-exaltation, self okay, exaltation, uh, it's very good. So, so we're made in the image of God. When we were made in the image of God, we were made in the glory of God. And the glory of God was for us to be able to represent God by having dominion over all of creation. Right. So he said, go rule over the, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, over all of God's created beings so that God would be glorified. And so we were made actually with the disposition to have selfless power. But instead, when man sinned and when man fell and fallen from the very glory of God, what ended up was that from what it was a selfless became selfish pursuit. And it led to self on aggrandizement. Basically, in Genesis chapter 11, we see that where they wanted to make a name for themselves to reach up to the tower, right? To, to reach up to the heavens where God is. Until date, man is now dabbling and babbling for power and the pursuit of power. And that's why we see all the conflicts, whether it's in our corporations, whether it's in our schools, whether it's in our churches. We see all these issues because everyone is seeking that power. And it's because of man's fallen state. What we do have to recognize, though, is there is absolutely no one who's got absolute power except God himself. And God, in his absolute power, can never use it for any corrupt purposes, which is another thing as we look at it from the theology aspect, the doctrine of God, that his power cannot be ever corrupt because there is no evil in him. And so that's the beautiful thing about us knowing that God is the only one who is omnipotent. And that means he's got absolute power and it's beyond measure. It's abundant in power. And as, as the psalmist declares over here, and that he will never use it for evil purposes. In fact, he looks for the best interest of every man and all of creation. And that's the wonderful thing that we can learn about God himself as we study about his omnipotency. So one was that God has got absolute power. The second thing is another way to look at the omnipotence of God is that there is no realm over which God's power and authority is limited. And so some examples over here are that he's got, and we'll look at these in more detail, his power over creation, his power over diseases, his power over demons, his power over the devil, and his power over death itself, which is the power of the devil. And so we'll expand on that more. 
So a couple of verses that to talk about, about God's sovereign power or absolute power over or his omnipotence over creation is in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, where we read, Our Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. It goes back to the same thing where is anything too hard for the Lord? Is, it, is there anything that is wonderful, marvelous or miraculous that is impossible for God? Nothing is, is what he's saying. And then Job chapter 38, uh, you know, verse 4 to 11 talks about the limitations of man and the unlimited power of God, where it says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? sunk or who laid its or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb when i made clouds its garments and thick darkness its waddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed meaning to say that god's power is over all of creation he's talking about the heavens the earth the waves the sea and all of creation and man itself he's asking job like where were you Right when I said all these things in creation, where were you in, in point in time that you are not as powerful or even with all of your understanding, what you think you know, you don't know enough. But not only is God's power over man and over uh, his creation, it's over the animal kingdoms too. And God can use animals to do work and his will. And we know that from the example of Balaam's donkey, where not only could it talk, it also could count. We see God used raven, ravens to feed his prophet, uh, which actually, if, if you think about a bird, a raven, if it finds food, the first thing it does is it takes and flies away from there. But in this case, it's going against the very nature you would think of raven for it to be able to bring food to one of God's people. Uh, God speaks to the great fish and it swallows uh, the prophet Jonah. And then when he speaks to it again, he, it spits him out. Uh, the lion's mouth was shut when Daniel was in the, in, put into the lion's den. So we see how God can use his created beings to do his work and his will. The question then we should be asking ourselves, if God can use the animals, why is God not using us? Or how is it that we can be made use by God to be able to reflect his power and his, his omnipotence to the people around us? So not only are the animals are under God's power, but also the inanimate of creation. So the winds and the waves are there to do his bidding. And the best known example is obviously about the one that we common, commonly or fa more familiarly know about Jesus calming the storm, which is recorded in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. So I'm going to read that because there are certain texts and applications I want to draw from it in terms of God's omnipotence and in Jesus calming the storm. So verse, Matthew chapter eight, verse 23 to 27, it says, and when he was entered into a ship in this, in, or boat, his disciples followed him and behold, there arose a great tempest or a great storm in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. This is like the waves, the ship is about to be capsized and the waves are going to drown the ship. But he was asleep talking about Jesus. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. So you see from great storm to great calm in terms of what God is able to do by just his words. And then the men marveled, it says, but the men marveled saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The applications or lessons that I can take away from this is that we have to follow Jesus into the boat, even if we are going to run into the storms of life. The important thing is that we are where Christ is. Storms of life are not only just some mere waves that come to buffet against our, our lives, but these are actually the ones, the winds that assail against us are great storms. These things that can actually capsize our lives and that they can make us think that we're going to drown unless we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, save us lest we perish. And then God may seem like he's actually, you know, if you think about our lives, he may, it may seem like he's sleeping or, uh, you know, or that he's not actually paying attention. But the good thing is when he is still around in the boat with us in our life. So we ought not to be fearful of the situation, but to be able to put our faith and trust in him, even if it's a little faith, so that we can see Jesus arise and rebuke the storms and the sea to give us that great calm. And he can do these marvelous, wonderful, miraculous things to give us calm and to give us a peace that passeth all understanding. In fact, Jesus said, my peace I leave, leave with you, not as the world leaves, 
lest your heart not be troubled, nor let it be afraid. So I don't know what situ- John chapter 14 verse 27. I don't know what situations of life that are buffeting against your li- you, but in all of it, recognize that when God is in the boat, in the life of in the lifeboat with us, we are able to be able to have calm because he's the one under whom all of the storms of life and all of creation itself succumb to because of his omnipotence. Now, not only is the the, the, the lack of peace because of the storms of life that can be attributed primarily to and predominantly to the, to the effect of the fall of man. Uh, but I want you to imagine a world that is without sin. How will that look like? What would you say, those in the room or in the, what would, what would you say is a world where there is no sin? Or, it, or imagine actually that Adam never How would that look today? Then there'll be unity. Of course, peace. Peace. Activity. Okay. Be guilt free. There'll be guilt free because there's no concept of guilt. Mm. Okay. So, in, is anybody in the, the uh, uh, online? Any thoughts? All right. I'll start with the few that I was listing down. There will be no funeral homes or undertaker business because there will be no death. Okay. There'll be no need for toiling for work because work itself would be fun and productive. So we wouldn't have to work by the sweat of our brow or the sweat of our face to be able to do and get to be able to sustain life because we'll be in relationship with God, okay? There'll be no poverty because the world will be productive and there'll be no thorns or thistles. Only good produce will come from the land. Uh, There'll be no fear or dread of animals like snakes or or sharks or anything else because mankind would have dominion over those uh, those creation of the animal and the plant kingdom over God's created world. For women, this is exclusive. There'll be no pain in childbirth, okay? Or um, there'll be no hierarchical relationship with your husbands, which led to many marital conflicts because your desire will be to have to have your husband and he will rule over you was what was given to the woman. So, you know, um, blame it on Adam but or Andy, <laughs> but that would not have happened. Uh, on a more mundane aspect of like day-to-day life, uh, there are certain additional views. There'll be no police force and no jails because there'll be no crime. Okay, you wouldn't have like lock lock business would not be there at all because there'll be no theft. Uh, clothing stores, there won't be any clothing store because there is no shame. So no Levi's, no J C Penney's or wherever you go, right? Uh, you wouldn't have that. Uh, for the youth, there will be no need for perfume like Versace or Obsession or you know, Gucci, Nobile, whatever you take, uh, because there'll be no stink. Uh, and then there'll be no doctors, no hospitals, because there'll be no disease as the body would not actually decay or die. So talking about that in the context of a world without sin, the world with sin is the one that brought about disease into the world. And God's power is over creation and over, over disease as well in terms of, so, you know, 1 Kings chapter 13 has a fascinating account about a king called Jeroboam. Now, this king called Jeroboam in a place called Bethel, and Bethel is Bayet El, which is house of God. In this place, he's building these altars to sacrifice and to be able to worship other idols that are not Jehovah or not God himself. And so a man of God from Judah goes to visit this king. And as he goes there, he tells and he prophesies and says to the altar, and he says, oh, altar, oh, altar, this today is going to be actually torn down and it's going to be burnt into ashes. And it's going to come down, right? It's going to be completely destroyed. The king, in his fury, he gets so angry that he say, because the, this man of God is speaking against uh, uh, the king and his idol worship, that the king stretches forth his hands and says, seize it, right? The moment he says that, his hand dries up and it, it says it shrivels up or it dries up and the man and the king cannot actually pull, pull his hand back anymore. So then the king looks at uh, this man of God and the man of God is actually unnamed in this. And the man of God is asked and he's, the king says, please plead to the Lord to help have him restore my hand. And the man of God calls out to the Lord. And when he does calls a call out to the Lord, the king's hand is restored and he's able to, is, is back to normal. Then the king says, come to my house and I will give you good food and water and I'll let you, you know, uh, sup with me. And the man of God says, even if you give me a whole house or so, I will not come because God has told me not to have anything to do with you, eating, drinking, having communion with you. And I have to go back and I'm going to have to go back in a way that's not to the way of Bethel. And that's what the man of God does. The point here is that when the man of God cried out to, the, to God for this king, 
over the disease of a shriveled hand, God was able to restore him right there. This is also a warning for us that if our hearts are idolatrous, we could get to that point where we become actually paralyzed in our idolatry. And so we would be careful that we don't pursue the things other than God so that we get paralyzed as this, this king was and King Jeroboam was. So that's one example. Also, you have probably heard about the example in 2 Kings chapter 5 about Naaman, how he was cured of his leprosy. And, his, and it says that his flesh became like a child, sort of young child, so like a baby's flesh, right? Amazing, like a young man having that kind of like all these face lotions and all that stuff. You know, he didn't need it all because God's power was over this disease that was so grave and so disfiguring, figuring, which was a, the Hansen's disease or lepers. Now, the Bible records many other instances of Jesus blind, the deaf, the mute, the lame, shriveled, you know, the ones that were suffering with cerebral palsy, the ones that are having hemorrhaging issues, uh, women, and then Hansen's disease as the leper. And in parallelism to those two examples that we saw with respect to a shriveled hand of, or a you know, dried up hand of the, of the king and that of uh, Naaman, we see actually in Luke chapter 6 how Jesus restores the shriveled hand of another man in the presence of people in the synagogue, which is recorded in Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 7 to 9, and Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19, talks about how Jesus healed 10 lepers and then one came and thanked them. What I want you to recognize is this, the application is that we are all shriveled and paralyzed because of the effect of sin. We are actually disfigured. We are disfigured or marred from the glory and the image of God. And unless we cry out and we say, God, help us, the touch of the omnipotent God is needed. And it's interesting where in the book, in the, in the, in the Bible, if you look at it, Jesus, whenever he dealt with lepers, it says that he felt his eyes were filled with compassion and he touched them and he healed them. That's the touch. That's beautiful like because people, they were ostracized. They were the untouchables. Today, we actually do that within our, like we, we treat others as lepers, right? And we treat, we, because, of, because of the sin in us, we look at others and we look at the plank in another person's eyes when we have, even we look at the, the speck in another person's eyes when we have plank in ours. We need the touch of Christ to be able to heal us so that and men and women should be able to entreat God and say, Lord, heal us and help us. And that should be the prayer that should be praying, which was Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14 says, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I'll be saved and for you are my praise. So God's power is over diseases. Not only is God's power over diseases, God's power is over demons as well. Martin Luther, the, the reformist in the, the lyrics of the, the book uh, to the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, in stanza three beautifully pensives, and this is what he says, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little world shall fell him. Martin Luther recognized the power that God has or the omnipotence that God has, not only in the physical realm over creation, but also in the spiritual dimension, in the spiritual realm, that he, he kind of pens this word. Um, now, Jesus' power over demons was so evident to the point that the religious leaders and the legalists of the time, the Pharisees and the scribes, ended up actually accusing Jesus blasphemingly and saying that it was by the power of Beelzebub that Jesus was doing it. And Jesus teaches these foolish men a very strong lesson. And he says, you are not smart as, you're not even as smart as the devil because this devil himself won't fight within himself, right? A house divided against himself won't, won't stand. And that's the trick of the devil. He wants to split. He wants to be able to bring division within and so what we want to recognize is that is his schemes but within his own demonic forces he will never dis he will never fight each other and jesus is establishing that right in this in this context and he's teaching them this lesson we'll expand more on this when we talk about like angelology and demonology but for now what i want you to recognize is this one pericope or this one account where jesus actually heals a demonic and it's in luke chapter 4 verse 31 to 37 and it's interesting but if you read that it says and came down it talks about you know the jesus's power over say over, over demons and it says and came down to capernaum a city of galilee and taught them on the sabbath days and they were astonished at his doctrine talking about jesus teaching in the synagogue for his word was with power was with authority and in the synagogue was a man. Now it's all there itself. I'm like, we should stop. This is in the synagogue was a man 
which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. So we need to be, we need to recognize that the devil will be in the presence of our churches, right? Because he wants to attack it. He wants to attack the body of Christ to disfigure it. He wants to attack the bride of Christ to make it ugly. He wants to attack the building of Christ so that he can destroy it and demolish it. And so the, the, he will be there where God's people are and we've got to be careful about it. So it says, and in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. And here's what is beautiful. The demon is actually now recognizing the very authority and the omnipotence of God. And it says, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, uh, thou, the, thou Jesus of Nazareth? So it identifies Christ specifically knowing that, you know, it is Christ that these demons are talking about. And it's, it says actually in plural, leave us alone. Right. So it's not just one demon. It's demonic forces that are that have put this man in, in, in oppression. In fact, the word demon possessed. The rightful word is demon oppress your demons because it's it's how they take control and they oppress this, the, the people. And so we see, art thou come to destroy us? So they know that Jesus is the one who's going to be the destroyer of all of, of devil and his followers and his, and his demons. I know who you are the Holy One of God. A demon or demons recognize the holiness and the power of God and in Christ. Are we doing the same? Think about it. Or are we so much so self-centered that we don't recognize what even the demons do? And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, the demons, and they come out and the fame of him grew out. Now, not only, not, not, not only is Jesus' power over the demons, Jesus' power is over the prince of demons of Satan himself. In fact, Job chapter 1 verse 8 and Job chapter 2 verse 3 talks about how the, the Satan has to ask the permission of God before he can do anything against God's people. So we see that in the context of how God is omnipotent over all spiritual realms, the demon and the devil, demons and the devil themselves. Now, not only is he, you know, is, is, he, is, is he over the, uh, the demons and the devil, the power of the devil is death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says that the power of he came to destroy him, the devil and his power, which is death. Okay, the finality of life for those who are not in Christian in, in the faith of Christ is death. For us, it is just a comma. It's not a period. It's the passing on to the next, uh, to our next uh, state with, to be with God. But death itself is powerless against the omnipotent God. And what we see over here is that in the book, uh, we know of Lazarus' resurrection. We know about uh, Jesus actually called out Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Jesus, the shackles of death could not hold him. And Lazarus came forth. Somebody actually said that if Jesus had not said, Lazarus, come forth, all the tombs in Jerusalem in that place that would have all everybody would have come out of the of the grave right then right because the power of his word would have gone and broken all the shackles that death held the people down there and it would have come now um, the resurrection thing is not just a New Testament concept after Jesus was uh, on on scene. It's been actually told in the Old Testament as well. We see a couple of examples of that. With the widow's son in 1 Kings chapter 17, we read about 17 to 24. We see the widow's son that's raised by Elijah. In um, 2 Kings uh, 4, verse 18, 20, 32 to 37, we see the Shunammite woman, her grown up son is raised, uh, you know, is by Elisha. Uh, Jonah the prophet, I believe, was raised, was resurrected because he died in the belly of the fish as Christ died. And so, you know, the sign of Jonah is what the sign of Christ. If Jonah had not died, then Christ had not died. So Christ makes that symbolic reference about the sign of Jonah that will be given. So Jonah died and he was resurrected. So when he was vomited back, who knows in what state he came, but he came back out in resurrected form, right? Is what my belief is. And the Bible actually substantiates that from, from the scripture reading that we have as you go down, as you went down to the Sheol is what it says, to the depths. And then when he looks up to the heavens in Jonah chapter 2, and he says, I called up to heavens and salvation is from the Lord. And then God spoke to the fish. So, and he's resurrected. But I want you to think of, of this, this two verses in the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 13. And it's actually a fascinating account where Elisha the prophet dies and they buried him. Okay, 
and the bands and the bands of the Mo Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. So the Moabites are coming against this land. Elisha is dead and he's buried. And it came to pass as this group of people were burying a man. Okay, they beheld and they saw a band of men. So they saw these moriders that are coming. They are burying this man, and then they they saw these guys are coming to 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 raid them. They say they cast the man into the sepulchre of Elisha. So they didn't even give him a decent burial. They just threw him into the tomb that was there. Okay, and when the man was let down, and it touched the bones of Elisha. Now what that means is that Elisha has been dead and gone for some time. If his body had become bones. Is dead and is gone for some time. So it touched the bones, right? This man revived and stood up. And you can see the, you probably should have seen, I wish I was there because I would have loved to see the friends of this man who was burying and they throw him in, he comes back up alive. And they're like, what is going on over here, right? So the point here is that the righteous die, but life is not stopped. Life, the power of God, the omnipotence even through the dead bones over here though, and then reach to those. So our life should be the life that is lived as that of Prophet Elisha to be able to bring God's power to flow through us. And it's God who raises up. It's not Elisha who raised this, this man, right? So it's a, it's a fascinating account. Second Kings 2 verses where it talks about the resurrection over there, about God's omnipotence over death. And we thank, I thank God for that. Now, we started this whole thing by saying, um, this omnipotent study by saying, you know, what does it mean when we say well, God is omnipotent? And I said that God's power is absolute, that there is no realm over which God's power is limited or it's it, it stopped, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's over disease, demons, devil, and death itself. But finally, I want us to also think about something that's very important, that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. That's the concept of the whole core of what it means when we say that God is omnipotent, meaning to say that God is sovereign and there is absolutely nothing that is so hard for the Lord. In fact, this was the question that was posed by God himself to Abraham and to Sarah. And we read that in the account where we see the account of, um, you know, in, in the book of Genesis, we read it where God is asking um, Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18. It says um, there are actually three men that come. The Lord appears to Abraham and Abraham lifts up his eyes and he sees three men that are standing. Abraham verses one and two, then three to eight is about Abraham welcoming them. And he offers them water. He offers them butter and milk. And then he prepares some meat calf for, for them. And then 9 to 15 is actually the conversation that takes place between Abraham and, 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 and these three men. And, and it says, and they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent, right? Um, this is actually Rembrandt, Rembrandt's painting. And you can see Sarah in the back over there, Abraham over here, and then the three visitors. And he said, I will certainly return unto you you according to the time of life and lo Sarah your wife shall have a son and Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women meaning that she was in the time of her menopause it was impossible for a woman to bear a child naturally therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying am I waxed old shall I have this pleasure my Lord being old also and the Lord said unto Abraham why did, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I of a surety bear a child which I'm old? Why did you laugh is what God is asking. Or why did Sarah laugh? Is, then he go, poses this question, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I'll return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. If you read that account carefully, there's a question that is posed, but the answer is not given. But what you see over here is, number one, God is saying that I'm omnipotent and that there is nothing that is hard for me. God's also, in this case, demonstrate he's omniscient. He knows the very thoughts. Because it says over there, if you read the words carefully, that Sarah laughed within herself. She didn't audibly laugh, right? And if we think that we can get away by having thoughts that we can fool God, then we are the fools, right? And so it's important for us to recognize that God is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows our thoughts. He knows all things. And what is impossible for man naturally is possible with God naturally and supernaturally, okay? And so he is in the wonderful work of taking things that are barren, 
and giving life. Sarah's in the book of faith, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Sarah and her faith, and it says, a dead womb is made alive. So we may be thinking that in our life there are situations that are just dead and hopeless and gone. It's an impossibility. It's naturally not going to happen. And this is where God is saying, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything that I cannot do? He can take that which is barren, dead, and he can make it life and abundant life that comes from it. That's the beauty of our God. And as we learn about God in theology, we learn that with God, all things are possible. In fact, Jesus reasserts this. The question that was asked by God to Abraham, Jesus reasserts this and he asserts this in the book, in the first book of the New Testament, as, as was asked in the first book of the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, it says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. What is Jesus talking about over here when he's talking about with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19. We need to actually read the verses above that and below that in terms of the context, because the context that he's talking about that this is impossible is salvation. Those things that you can be self-sufficient world and the materialistic things that are to be greater than that of the love for God and his spiritual things. In fact, it's the account of the, the discourse that takes place between the rich man and, and Jesus, where a rich man comes to him. And so we'll read that text because I don't want to lose out the details as to what God is saying is impossible for man, that man cannot save himself, right? God is the only one who's got the power to be able to do it and in Christ Jesus, which will be established soon here. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 18 to 27 says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to do inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why call me good? No one is good except one that is God. What Jesus is doing over there is beautiful in that discourse where he says, Matthew 19, 18 and 19, saying, You're calling me good. Meaning otherwise, you're calling me God because there is no one who's good but God. So Jesus asserts and he reestablishes his divinity over there before he even asks or answers the question of this rich man. And then Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Now what Jesus is doing is interesting. I don't believe there is a gradation of sin, right? Sin is sin in the eyes of God, whatever it is. Right, But the no consequences of knowing the sin and then doing it, there is a greater responsibility for us and God will judge accordingly. But there is no gradation of sin because Jesus saying, oh, you don't commit adultery. Many of you may say, I've never done that in my life. Do not kill. Nobody over here is a murderer. Then he goes on and says, do not steal. Okay, I really have no, I'm not a theft, I'm not a robber, but maybe we steal from God from the tithes and the talents that we have that we don't give. Then he says, do not bear false witness that everybody is there. Like we all lie. Right? There's no one who can say, I have not lied. Because if you say you've not lied, you've lied. Okay? And so over here, God's like, there's no one who's going, and then honor your father and mother. And he said this, and all these have I kept from my youth. So this guy is actually saying, all these commandments are kept from my youth. That's amazing that to Jesus, a man is able to say, I've actually kept the law. And what God is going to establish, it's not the law that saves you, it is the Lord that saves you. And so he says, now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, you lack one thing, sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. I want us to be careful. This is not salvation by works. Don't go do these things to earn your salvation. In fact, it's saying give away everything so that you can store up treasures up in heaven. But what Jesus is saying is your salvation is a matter of the heart. Are you willing to come follow me? leaving behind everything that you have. Total obedience to God is what God, God Christ is expecting over here. And so over here, when he heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. Okay. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it's easier for a camel to go through a needle side than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? The others who are over there, they're like, who can be saved? You can't trust in your riches. You can't trust in all of keeping of the law and everything else. Who then can be saved? That's the question that the world is asking today. The question is, do you and I have the answer in pointing them to Jesus Christ? Or are we doing that? And he said, this thing, which are impossible with men, are possible with God. So by Christ, through Christ, and by him and for, by Him alone, can man be saved, where the dead are made alive, and you're translated from the life of death 
into a life of, you know, we're actually all born dead. Even though we come with breath in our lives, we're all born dead. And when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are born again with life, with the spirit of God, that as, as was when Adam was created in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, where God's breath came into the man and man became a living soul, all right? About that camel entering into the eye of a needle, if you have any questions about that, I don't want to digress over here, but there are theories about it. We'll talk about what that means later. Uh, at another time, or just ask me about that, right? Um, so this question about why is it that man cannot save himself? What's that, what, what does that mean? In fact, man is impotent. Now, when we talk about impotent, usually we think of it in the context of a limitation by libido from a sexual connotation standpoint. I'm not talking about that. The word impotent means that the inability to, for somebody to help themselves or take any action to be able to get out of that situation. So man is helpless or impotent in that manner that they're powerless and God alone is. In fact, Psalm chapter 40 verse 2, it says, He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on the rock and established my going. In fact, what is interesting is if you think of this clay, think of it like quicksand or quicksand or, or you know, or sinking sand. But what they, they found out is it's actually water that's covered with sand. And you think that it's actually, you know, it's sand. You step on it, you sink in it, you get stuck. And you, you know, if, you go, if, you, if you have um, uh, in your yard that is loose soil and you put water and then you go step on it, you let get stuck in that, right? If there's no grass or something to, 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 to buffet it. But if you, if you get stuck in it and you find it difficult to pull out of it, and what they found out is in quicksand, the more you struggle, the more you sink, the faster you sink. All right. So Inside Edition actually did a really good video about if you ever find yourself stuck in quicksand, this is how you will escape. And what they tell you is don't struggle, right? Be calm, don't struggle. Two, find, have somebody pass you a pole or a, or a wooden stick. And then you take the stick and put it behind your back and try to prop your legs up so that you can go into a, a lying position and then wade your way out. All right. So your leg comes out. The problem is, there should be somebody to give you the stick, right? Otherwise you're gonna start. God in his infinite grace and mercy and his goodness provided the wooden cross so that we can lay on it because he lay on it so that we can be saved. There is no other means. In fact, we see that where it talks about in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse uh, 22 verse 47, it says, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It says here, the psalmist says, he brought me out of the mighty clay and set my foot upon a rock and established my going. That rock, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 says, is that rock is Christ. Jesus Christ is the omnipotent for the impotent. Okay, so what was impossible for man, the great I am makes it possible and Jesus is that great I am. God who said, my name is the great I am, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the resurrection. And even if anyone is dead, yet they shall live because he is life and he is omnipotent and powerful. And then the last part over here I want to, before we get in time of discussion is the resurrected Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection. And this is what he tells. All authority, all power, omnipotence of God is mine. It's given to me. Therefore, now you go and you make disciples. You teach them, you baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And behold and lo, I am with you always. What, we, what the problem, why we refrain or we have difficulty um, in going and sharing the gospel with others is because we are afraid. We are afraid that we'll be ashamed. We are afraid of ridicule. We are afraid of the way that somebody may persecute us for the life that we live or for the lips that, for the words that we speak about Christ. Or that we are afraid that we may actually preach something and or share the gospel and not and live a duplicitous life. But what God is establishing over here is the Great Commission is sandwiched between the power of God and the presence of God. He says, all power is given to me. I will be with you always. Therefore, you go. When we recognize that God is omnipotent and he's omnipresent with us, you know, and he knows all things and he's omniscient, the great commission becomes something that we can actually go and actually practice 
and live the life that we truly are following the words of Christ where he says come follow me and we follow him as he followed us and pursued us when we were still sinners Jesus died for us when we did not deserve to be to be saved and he is the one whose his cross is the one by which we can come out of this mighty pit of sin and there is no other means because God is omnipotent and without Christ we are basically lost so the question I wanted to ask is today we learned about the omnipotence of God God is all powerful he's his power is absolute the question I should ask is and that that power is absolutely pure as well and there is no evil because of his absolute love for us so the question I'm asking myself and each of us should be asking is that are we under the absolute power of God and do we absolutely love him for he first loved us Jesus said if you love me you'll keep my commandments and his commandments to love God and to love man and to keep his commandments is what he's asking us to do. that's number one two is there is no realm and you know over which God's power or authority is limited. So God's power is over creation, over creatures, over diseases, over demons. De the question is, are you a translated from death to life? The barren has made abundant. And that which we think is not possible, God has made possible. So in that manner, is, is it, are you alive? Have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, today is your day for you to become alive, to be born again, and to be, have eternal life. It means also that God is sovereign and there is absolutely nothing too hard for the Lord. So I would ask you, is what, what situations of your life today that you can think of where you're saying, this is an impossible situation. Maybe it's in your work, maybe it's in your health situation, maybe it's in the way that you have relationships that are being shattered or, or torn apart. I don't know what the situation is, but there is something that every one of us are facing under the fallen world and being in this fallen world. What is it that God is asking you to say, if you think it is impossible for you, lay it at my hands and I am possible and I will make those things possible according to his permissive and perfect will. So I'll open it up for a time of discussion, thoughts, comments, questions feedback um, and um, anything else I can start with those in the room or what are some takeaways what are some things that uh, you learned today okay anyone No questions, no comments. What was one thing you learned today that you did not know before? The, the, the Jeroboam's, the Bethel story. Yeah, it was in the house of God, idolatry. And, and I, I wish we were there to see and witness these things. How amazing God's power. Huh? That's why the Bible is for <laughs> everybody, believe it. Yeah. How much more beautiful it will be. Yeah the Jeroboam story. Yeah. I like about that the dead man has the bones. And he became alive. Like right. And he was the thing was raising his corpse. How, how amazing it is when you see the dead man come alive. Like, right. That, that part, like, I like it. I didn't, I didn't realize that like, we should be, like, we should be a part of that. Right. Uh, like, when we were telling the story. Right. I'm amazed that we see the presence of God. Like, right, right. And yeah. also, the, it's it's beautiful in terms of god's word so inspired by the holy spirit right cannot be wrong the connection points and the touch points of how just as we read it we like the more and more you read the word and the more you study and meditate you like will fall in more and more in love with god we go like how amazing he is and then it's like and then on the other side you're also scared of like we're nothing <laughs> Belly of, the belly of the fish for three days, but it's very clear the sign of Jonah is equivalent this, to uh, Jesus. Jesus' death and right, yeah. uh, being risen on the third day. Right. So there is no doubt when we read the Bible, to signs believe. are given right. ahead of time about things that are right. going to happen. Right. That's a good observation. In fact, it's interesting with uh, 
with uh, the sign of Jonah. Often in Sunday school, we teach them where you, we teach people to draw, the kids to draw, and they'll draw Jonah like kneeling down and praying inside the belly of the fish, right? Um, I can't think logically also, like you, it's an impossibility because it's, yeah, it talks about where Jonah chapter two, if you go and read, it says seaweed was my turban, right? Meaning there was, and then waters engulfed me. And I went down to the depths of Sheol, which is the place for hell, where the dead are, right? And then he says, and from there, I looked up to the holy mountain and I saw God's, you know, and I cried out to God. And then I, and then he, salvation is of the Lord. So Jonah chapter two, verse 10. So, and then if he had not died, then in fact, Jesus is asked for signs in the New Testament when Jesus asked, he's like, show us your signs, right? To prove that you are God. And it's like, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah, that he will die and he'll be resurrected. So, you know, all right, let's pray. Loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray, O oh Father, that you'll be with us as we continue to meditate on your word throughout the course of this day. It's, it's your holy day. It's your worship, O oh Master. Help that to be the day. Uh, we can learn from your word how omnipotent you are, how amazing you are, how powerful you are, and um, that there is nothing that is too hard for you. There is nothing that is impossible. If there's anyone over here who has either heard or has committed and they've believed in you, I pray, O Lord, that you will bring them and you'll raise them up uh, from death to life and that you, Lord, be their God and their guide and their companion um, and their provider, o Master. I thank you, Father, that there is, uh, the more we struggle in our sin, the more we sink. But I thank you, Lord, that you are the king that can take away all sin, o Master, and uh, by your cross, uh, uh, you've given us the means to be rescued from the mighty pit of uh, sin and the horrible pit. Uh, establish our foot and establish our going on you alone, Lord Jesus, our rock, our redeemer, our savior. I thank you, Father, for who you are. I praise and thank you for your love for us. And uh, uh, you love us because uh, of who you are. Help us to love you, Lord, because of who you are and what you've done for us. Uh, we can never, ever repay you, Master, but we thank you, Father, that you accept us just as we are and you help us to be able to be part of the family of God, uh, not by our works, not by any of our penance or any of the, the, the things that we have to do, but solely by the work of Christ on the cross. We believe in it. We thank you for all your goodness, all your grace um, and uh, Father for you. Uh, be with each one over here and everyone who's listening. I ask you that you'll be with them and you'll bless them and their families so that, Lord, they will be a blessing to the people around. And those who do not know you are still dead. I pray, O oh Father, that you'll help us to be the witnesses, help us to be assured of your power and your presence that always goes with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and you're omnibelevant. You love us and help us to love you for you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let me stop recording. Thank you all for coming. Uh